Hello everybody, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the International Myeloma Workshop here in New Delhi for the 2017 meeting. It's my pleasure to be here today actually with my wonderful friend and colleague, Professor Mary V. Mateus, uh, who is actually leads the program at the University of Salamanca in Spain. Mary V, welcome and lovely to be with you. Thank you um, very much. It's been a wonderful meeting, hasn't it? It's great to be here in New Delhi. And I think quite, quite actually quite a testimony to the extraordinarily international nature of the myeloma research community. Yes, you are absolutely right. And uh, so it's a pleasure also for me to be here in New Delhi, enjoying this uh, international myeloma workshop. Absolutely. And I think we've had some very exciting data. And if I may, to sort of dive straight into that, um, we had uh, some really, a really interesting session yesterday on smoldering myeloma from biology to clinical translation. And obviously your pivotal work in this field um, with really your groundbreaking phase three trial um, published in the New England Journal a few years ago has really opened the door um, to exploration in this area. And I wondered, Mary V, if you could uh, share with me what, 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 what are the sort of takeaways that you took from the session yesterday? And then perhaps I can give you some of my own thoughts. Yeah, you know that smoldering is uh, a plasma cell disorder characterized by an end component higher than 3 and or plasma cell bone marrow infiltration between 10 and 60, but uh, with no myeloma defining event. And uh, myeloma, smoldering myeloma is a heterogeneous disease and I think that this is one of the main problems because uh, we call a smoldering myeloma to patients with a very low risk of progression to myeloma, but also we call a smoldering to patients in which the risk of progression is high. I think that some years ago, the International Myeloma Working Group did a great effort for the identification of ultra high risk smoldering myeloma patients, those with a risk of approximately 80% of progression risk to myeloma at two years. These patients should not be called anymore smoldering. These patients are now myeloma and they have to start active treatment. The problem is what happens with the other smoldering myeloma patients, with those patients in which the risk of progression is approximately 50% at two years. We know how to identify them and the question mark is if we should treat or not to these patients. As you mentioned, the Spanish Myeloma Group conducted a phase three randomized trial showing a significant benefit treating these patients with lenalidomide and dexamethasone in terms of time to progression because so was significantly delayed in comparison with no treatment. And also we observed a benefit in terms of overall survival. It's true that this is the unique phase three randomized trial with consolidated results at the present time. Probably we have to wait to know the results of the other trials that uh, they are being conducted at the present time. But uh, if I have to envision, I think that in the future, I would say that probably high-risk smoldering myeloma patient should be incorporated to the definition of myeloma. And myeloma will be treated as uh, you treat your patients with newly diagnosed myeloma. And I think that this would be the optimal way. I completely agree with you. The takeaway I had from yesterday um, when we listened to the science from Dr. Burke Seigel and Dr. Mitziades was essentially the same degree of heterogeneity and evolutionary thrust that we see with active myeloma. So I wasn't left with anything scientifically at the preclinical or biological level that sort of distinguished where we might be, um, other than perhaps some features of gene expression profiling. But I think that but, um, my impression clinically was exactly as you say, that I think we'll ultimately be left with active myeloma and MGUS, and this smoldering space um, will, will evolve accordingly. Uh, and I think, you know, you're to be congratulated, I think, Mary V, at so many levels for really breaking the ground here. Um, I was impressed from the, the studies presented um, that, you know, on the one hand, active myeloma needs to be treated very proactively with Absolutely. the goal of durable remission and sustained and deep remission. Um, but at the same time, that in that gray area, toxicity really matters, doesn't it? And that was the impression I had from the, from the discussions held. Also, the other thing is the whole area of, uh, of, of how do you define endpoints in this group of patients. Uh, and I think that uh, Dr. Voorhees presented on the challenges there. And I was left with as many questions as there seemed to be answers. Um, so I wondered from, from what you heard yesterday, what direction do you think 
um, studies will go. Because what I saw was a sort of, you know, a very intensive approach on the one hand, and then a much more immunologically based approach on the other. And I wondered what you thought of that. So I think that both approaches are uh, are fine and are acceptable, mm -hmm. because uh, so if we consider that from the biological point of view, smoldering is different to myeloma because. Uh, so new events are necessary to right. move from even high-risk smoldering to myeloma. Right. Probably the immunotherapies approach are very attractive because you know that the immune system is much more preserved in these patients and the stimulation and the enhancement of the immune system probably is enough to control the disease. Yeah. However, on the other side, our proposal, our new proposal coming from the Spanish Myeloma Group and also from the International Myeloma Foundation is uh, to move forward and to try to cure these patients. And this is the reason why, why we have decided to approach with a much more intensive yes. option of therapy, including induction, transplant, consolidation and maintenance. So I think that we have to wait yeah. to have a more consolidated results. And concerning the safety profile, I have to say that uh, in our experience, smoldering myeloma are asymptomatic myeloma patients that uh, they are doing their daily living activities without any problem. Right. Toxicity profile is much more better than mm. symptomatic myeloma. Yes. And in fact, in the Kiredex trial, when we compared the Lendex yeah. versus observation, yeah. tolerability was perfect. Yes. And yes. Uh, few grade three, four adverse events so called. Mm. And the same we are seeing now in our new study, including carfilzomib as part of the induction yes. and also transplant. How very interesting because you know, I, I completely agree with you. I think the ability to look at both is very, very important. I think that the flip side of that is that the immunological aspects, to me certainly anyway, I'm very pleased with our own experience with monotherapy using elotuzumab. Very well tolerated, long, long disease control we've seen in our, in our single arm trial. So that's the caveat. However, what I have noticed is that um, in my asymptomatic patients, whilst I completely agree with you, their tolerability because they're stable is good. From a symptom point of view, from a patient perspective, they're far more sensitive to any side effects in the sense that they are not symptomatic to start with and they're not anticipating anything necessarily. So I think it's, it's very exciting. I think on the one hand, we've got the intensive approach. On the other hand, we have the more immunological based approach. And we will see, won't we, which translates into the better outcomes for these different groups of patients. But I do agree the heterogeneity will remain a challenge. Were you left with any particular, or do you have any messages for our audience, I should say, as to any particular aspects of biology that may help to start to sort of discriminate these two? Because I must say from the session yesterday, it wasn't clear to me that we're on, that we, we really understand that. But I wondered, Mary V, if you had any insights. So from the biological point mm. of view, so you know that if you do gene expression profiling, mm. There is some specific signature for the identification of smoldering right. and even high-risk smoldering mm -hmm. myeloma that is completely different from right. symptomatic myeloma. Mm -hmm. The problem is uh, that at least uh, for us in Europe, so we are not going to be able to use this uh, technology in our routine. Right. And uh, we have to do, of course, all these investigations in research yeah. to try really to identify and to know how the biology of the disease is different. Mm -hmm. right. and and what, what do you see in those, I mean, for example, just to drill down on that, in the gene expression signature that there is, could you share with our audience a little bit about that? Because, again, to me, from the presentations yesterday, I was clear that there are some features from Dr. Berksagel, but then in Dr. Mitziardi's presentation, there seemed to be greater complexity. And I just wondered, what, 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 what was your yeah, takeaway? I think that also at the last ASH committee, an abstract was presented by the group of Ola Landreth, in which uh, the mutations present in myeloma and present in smoldering were the same. The problem is that the number of patients with a, a mutational uh, burden was significantly lower in smoldering than in myeloma. And I think that only two out of 20 patients have this mutational profile, while patients with symptomatic myeloma, most of them have yes. this mutation. So I think that there are uh, clear proofs showing yeah. that the biology is different. Excellent. So in that context, just to sort of frame this for our audience again. Would you think, Mary V, that in the future, in this high-risk group, I, I fully agree with you, the ultra-high-risk group are active disease yeah. and need to be treated as such. This high-risk group, which is the target population, do you think will be left with a gene expression profile that will help us guide whether or not these patients either receive an immunological-based yes. strategy that's less intensive 
versus a more intensive full court for press. For sure, I think that it will be the future. Excellent. And if you if you could speculate, what would you see as the distinguishing features between those two groups in terms of mutational profile? So really, I don't know how are we going to proceed in the near future, but uh, so I think that patients with, uh, probably mm -hmm. it's also possible to evaluate the immune profiling right. and patients with one specific uh, uh, immune profiling right. can benefit uh, most uh, from an immunotherapeutic strategy based on emits plus uh, a monoclonal antibody, mm -hmm. whilst, oh, another, yeah, whilst yeah. another yeah. patients can benefit for yeah. a much more intensive yeah. option yeah. of therapy. Interesting. So, I, I would agree with you. So I think it won't be just necessary gene expression profiling. It'll be whether or not there's an immunological repertoire that can be yeah. exploited to maximize the advantage of that. And my sense from the conversations yesterday was that there will be specific oncogenes such as CMYK that tell us whether or not we're going to be, whether or not in a particular patient it is justified to move forward with a particular yeah. approach. So in a funny sort of way, we might be rather like our breast cancer counterparts in whom early breast cancer can be distinguished by gene expression profiling Absolutely. as to exactly what you add in terms of adjuvant therapy and we may be in that very exciting spot of a precursor illness in myeloma where we can as you say strive uh, for a cure mm -hmm.